Welcome to the fourth and last session of the analytics for archival processing. Um, my name is Richard Marciano. I'm a professor at the University of uh, Maryland High School, and I'm the uh, founder of the Advanced Information Collaboratory, also known as AIC. And I'll be presenting today um, a talk called Digital Curation and Machine Learning Experimentation Archives with uh, my fellow presenter, Teddy Ranby. I'm Teddy Ranby. I am an undergraduate uh, major in computer science at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, and I'm a research fellow for the AIC as well. Uh, just a little bit of context. Um, we're both members of the AIC. This is a, a collaboratory, virtual collaboratory that was started in January 2020, launched at the Ellen Turing Institute. Um, what's relevant to our presentation is, uh, is that some of the goals will be uh, on display uh, today in our talk. In particular, our focus is on exploring the opportunities and challenges of so-called disruptive technologies for archives and records management. These include digital curation, machine learning, AI, and others. The um, item number three is very relevant as well. We're interested in examining disruptive technologies towards leveraging uh, techniques, methodologies to unlock the hidden information one typically finds in massive stores of records. Um, these are some of the AIC founding partners. Uh, I've uh, distinguished colleagues from King's College, Drexel, the UK National Archives, former uh, US National Archives, technologists, uh, humanists, uh, art historians, uh, blockchain experts from Canada. Um, there's a much larger international network. This is really a community of interest. It features uh, research fellows such as uh, Teddy Ranby and practitioners, academics, technologists from uh, North America, well, virtually every continent other than Antarctica. So let's, uh, let's jump right in. Uh, I'll provide a little bit of context and Teddy uh, will do the heavy lifting and walk you through some of our machine learning approaches. We're working with um, an FDR uh, collection. It's a presidential library uh, collection called the Morgenthau Holocaust Collections Project. I want to acknowledge uh, my amazing colleagues at the FDR Presidential Library, Kirsten Carter, Bill Harris, and Abby Gondek, who have guided uh, this study um, since the beginning. The goal of our study is, is to automate item level metadata extraction, something that doesn't really occur a whole lot at this moment in time. You'll, you'll see what that means in the next few slides. Towards enabling new forms of scholarship, in particular on FDR and Roosevelt's response to the Holocaust. So this, is, this topic is of great interest to folks who are studying um, the impact uh, on the Holocaust as seen through federal policies under FDR. Um, Henry Morgenthau Jr. Was, was a very significant feature. He served for nearly 12 years as FDR's Secretary of the Treasury. And so he compiled over 860 diary volumes with incredible detail. Daily records of official activities, including transcripts of his meetings, telephone conversations, copies and originals of the most important correspondence, memoranda that passed over his desk, etc. There are two significant series, uh, volumes, which is what we're working with as part of this study, and also index cards, which are related. So you can see on the right some pictures of the bound volumes. That's the, um, and then to the right, uh, a page from the table of content from one of the bound volumes. Next slide. Oh my gosh. 
So um, we chose not to use traditional OCR or optical character recognition as a starting point. This is a screen that shows some earlier experimentation where we took individual index cards, which, uh, which are sort of used as finding aids, right, to the to topics in the over 860 bound volumes. And we applied sort of static um, analysis of the first line of each card to extract the, the header or the, the index subject uh, topic. So the first card would be Aachen, the second card would be Ahrens, Lehman, C, last two cards are the Zionist party and Zeta, Empress, former, etc. If we apply a uh, traditional OCR, we extract, I think, close to 8,000 uh, header um, topics. And um, if we compress that, it comes out to about 6,400 unique headers. Um, this is not very effective because um, the information we're trying to extract for the index cards is at the top left, but in general, it's all over the card. So we can't really use locality or geography, if you will. Uh, we, need, um, we need more flexible mechanisms, and that's what we're gonna see next. A um, Couple more slides. Uh, we're doing bound volume processing. And in order to set up the AI machine learning workflows, we have to massage the information. So what you see in the first three white boxes, it's actually how the website looks like for the uh, series one diaries. And it's literally an HTML file with information about each of the 864 volumes. Um, in this particular instance, you'll see a date, a range, and uh, highlighted in red, links to PDF files. So that's really what the current web-based finding aid looks like. It's, um, it's very helpful, but we're trying to go a little deeper. And what we, we have an algorithm here, it's uh, detailed in the paper of parsing this website um, and shaking loose all the references and objects that are linked from this website. So PDF files, dates on the HTML. So we're, we're, we're literally exploding these, this file into, um, into what becomes this, uh, this spreadsheet um, or this table that has metadata and references to actual objects. And if we go to the next slide, we go from that web page to what we call a content tree, where each entry uh, references a directory um, on disk with all the files um, that we've uh, extracted. And what you see in this particular instance is that the first, um, the first 10 pages of, the, of this PDF that's linked on the website um, actually gives you the table of content and we create one page, one JPEG image for each of the pages of the table of content. And this will be, this will serve as the input to the machine learning algorithm, which Teddy will walk you through. Uh, and before we really get into that algorithm, I do want to talk a little bit about why we made this decision to move away from the, from looking at the index cards in the first place. And this decision really came about because the index cards very much appear to be a rough draft. There's a lot of uh, data can be scratched out of the index cards. There can be lines handwritten on after the fact. And all of that makes for a data set that is not very easy to apply machine learning to. And when we took a deeper look at that, we saw that all of those changes that were retroactive on those index cards were reflected in their corresponding entries in the actual table of contents, but it was all taped out and uh, typed out and structured. So by looking at this table of contents, we can actually look at the, the final draft of those index cards and get a, a more 
structured and machine learning ready data set. But looking at all of these table of contents pages at once can be overwhelming to a, a machine learning algorithm. It's, it's hard to uh, accurately apply the, metal, the metadata that you need to the headers and the pages and the content of this uh, mass of a table of contents page. So the approach that we took was to try to take this table of contents page and sort of uh, re-explode it out back into its what might have been its original index cards. So we've taken here the, the three entries of this table of contents page and um, our machine learning model has exploded that back out into its three individual uh, index cards. And the goal of this is to allow the next phase of uh, machine learning to more accurately label with the metadata that we need to the card itself. So for this first example here, this social security bill will be given the header label and we'll have all the dates will be labeled and all of the page numbers will be labeled. And that's something that was more difficult to achieve when we're zoomed out and looking at the whole TOC page. But when we zoom in and look at a single entry, it's much more ready for machine learning. And this creating this model was accomplished by labeling a couple hundred of these table of contents pages by hand, basically just drawing on what these red boxes look like using the uh, machine learning auto ML uh, UI that Google has built in and a little bit of their API as well. It was, it's pretty, it's well documented and the process is tedious, but it is doable. And for looking at taking this output, we can put that into the input of phase two, which is actually applying that metadata that I was talking about. You can see here, the header has a blue box corresponding to the header metadata and all of the different items have their own metadata attached and that pulled out and parsed will look something like this where there will be an index card or a some sort of entry object that will have a header and content and dates and book and pages associated with it. All of this pulled out and parsed out of these pieces that we've pulled out of the table of contents. So we're really taking that single table of contents page and exploding it into a series of index cards and exploding those into these labeled, uh, these uh, labeled uh, text pieces, this metadata. And the rest of this talk is going to be focused on phase one. That is the most fleshed out at this point. We have a good proof of concept for phase two, but phase one is really where we've done most of the work at this point. And whenever you're talking about machine learning, the most important and talked about ways to evaluate the effectiveness of any model is precision and recall. And these are just some fancy machine learning words. In our context, precision is the, what percentage of the entries that you predicted did you predict correctly? And recall is what percentage of the correct entries did you actually predict? So precision has to do with false positives and recall has to do with false negatives and the rate at which they occur. Here we have an example of some false negatives and the way that we actually get these numbers that 96% for uh, precision and 80% for recall, Google actually does all of that evaluation for you when you finish training your model. And the way that it does that is it saves 10% of the training data that you give it for the end once the model is trained and actually uses that training data as a ground truth, like I have uh, written here, to compare its predictions against. And using those com comparisons, it can calculate some uh, precision and recall for you. But uh, in this case here, we can see that Google determined that these boxes that it drew versus the boxes that I drew when I was annotating they were different enough for Google to think that they were wrong when in reality, like uh, just looking at them, they are good enough to capture all the data that we need. So these, although Google said that they were different enough to be wrong for us, they were actually right. So that recall number is probably better than 80%. And here we have another example of uh, our model didn't predict an entry here for this 
small, I know it's hard to see, but there's a little gray box around consolidated gas company there. So that isn't expected to be pulled out as an entry, but our model didn't recognize it. But when you look at this entry, there isn't actually any data that our system will need. It's just a reference to another entry. And this was useful at this time when you, if you needed to look at consolidated gas company, you wouldn't be able to comb through the content of every single entry looking for it. It's, you had to just index into consolidated gas company and then that told you to look for an entry where there's actual data. But now since we can look through the content of these cards uh, towards the end when we can actually just search through it with a, uh, some sort of algorithm, it's not, it, it's not going to be necessary to have these kinds of entries anymore. So this doesn't actually need to be picked up by our model at all. And here we have some false positives. Uh, truncation isn't truly a false positive. That can just happen to any entry, but this was a convenient place to put it uh, in these slides. It is just when in the left or right direction, some of the entry is dropped off. And overlap here is when this uh, lower entry has picked up some data from an entry above it. So it sort of overlapped the box into the entry above it. And false, uh, more false positives include, here we can see another overlap, but we also have multiple entries being grouped into this one big box here. And so you can see bonus uh, brown and budget all grouped into this one box uh, when they should have been separated out to their smaller pieces. And after examining the first four volumes and the errors that occurred over the course of those volumes, we can see that the most common by far are truncation and overlap and the others occur pretty rarely. And this slide I've also grouped them by severity. And what severity means is the cost of potentially coming up with a solution to overcome this issue in the machine learning uh, data processing uh, process. The highest and the worst is dropped because that just, that is essentially just means that the, our machine learning model drew no boxes around a certain chunk of content. And for those entries where it's just a reference to another entry, that doesn't matter. But for entries where there's actual data or potentially just miss a line or two of an entry, that is bad and there's no way to recover from that. But all of the other ones can be recovered from and I'm going to go over that now, starting with truncation. This one is pretty simple because in the left and right direction, we don't actually need any of that, need to keep that part of the box because no entries will be left or right of each other, they will all be just vertically stacked. So we can just keep the top and bottom of each box and then just slice the page in half instead of pulling out entries. And when you pull out these slices, we can fix truncation completely. Overlap and extra are a little more complex and have to do with how we actually parse the data that we get back after phase two. Overlap is the simpler of the two because as we can see down here in this green box, the correct header that it's supposed to be referring to is stabilization, but it has overlapped up into the entry above it. And so when we're parsing this entry, we'll see a bunch of content and dates, and then we'll see the header stabilization. And since we have the metadata tags during parsing, while we're parsing, we know that we don't need any data until we hit a header. And when, as we're parsing, when we hit a header, then we can start collecting data and assigning it to that header. So any data before a header during parsing is lonely or doesn't, doesn't have any place to belong. Um, and we can move on to extra here, which is where this top social security entry has picked up about half of the entry below it. And this is a more complex of a problem because it requires the entries to have some context about the entries around them during parsing, which all of the other all the other problems have been independent of that and entries can just be parsed individually. But because the rest of the data for one of these entries is in another parsed entry, the only way that this can be solved is by giving, helping the entries talk to each other during parsing. 
And this is a problem that is solvable, but requires will require a much more complex mechanism during parsing to make sure that all the correct data is kept to its correct header. Multiple seems complex, but because we have the sophisticated parsing that knows about its own metadata during parsing, we can actually apply a simple a similar principle to overlap, which will which will remove, which will make sure that the data is applied to the header above it. So we'll read the social security bill header, append all of the data from that we run into after that until we run into the speeches header, and then we'll move on to appending data to that header. So even though we've captured multiple entries with one with one box, the purpose of the boxes is not to capture every header individually. It's only to shrink the problem so that phase two becomes easier. And phase two is still easy enough at this point with two entries that it is still doable. The next steps for this project include a refining phase two and the parsing and running that on all of the slices that we generated with phase one and then taking all of that data and deploying an API to give researchers and scholars access to this uh, newly generated data. Thank you very much for, um, for this walkthrough and uh, looking forward to the rest of the, uh, the workshop and any questions that uh, come out of this.